Welcome to Now Church. We are about to begin. Please take this opportunity to pull out your smartphone so you can like, share, and check in on our social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please use the hashtag NowChurch. Thank you, and enjoy today's service. Ocala, Florida, horse capital of the world, where the dawn of a new day brings a fresh opportunity to chase history, a bloodline destined for greatness, groomed from birth, trained to triumph over obstacles, powerful, graceful, majestic, it's here, strength is tested. It's here, endurance pushed to the limits. It's here, champions are made. A bird finale there, hits the bird. A bird's got a nose in front of me, come on to the wire. At the finish of one, he's dead right. And here it is, the 37 year wait is over. American Burrow is finally the one. American Burrow has won the Triple Crown. Watching these gentle giants ride to victory is truly a thing of beauty. But as a human being, it made me reevaluate. Who am I? What is my purpose? How can I win in this race called life? The journey led me to Now Church. I'll never forget the first time. Hands lifted high. Voices raised, a real encounter with Jesus Christ, an expression of love, an atmosphere of faith, a passion for others, all ages, all colors together as one for a cause greater than ourselves, serving our neighbors and reaching our world, to know God and make Him known. It didn't take long to realize this is where I belong. generation with a now sound and a now word.
Come on, welcome, welcome, welcome to Now Church. How y'all feeling this morning? Isn't God good? Amen. This morning, we wanted to, first of all, we want to welcome you, and we just are so excited that you chose to come to Now Church to get in the atmosphere and the presence of God, because this morning, he is here. If you feel his presence, there's nothing like coming together and worshiping our God. It's amazing. And, and maybe you come in here, maybe you, you were dragged here by some family, maybe you were, uh, uh, you know, bribed here, whatever. Maybe it's your first, second time here. We have something around here that we call a three week challenge. We have a challenge for you. And our three week challenge is maybe you're looking for a place to call home. Because here's the thing church is so important to us, and especially for me as, as a family man, I want my family to be raised in the church. So maybe you're looking for a good place to call home. We want to give you a three-week challenge that simply is you coming and trying out Now Church for three weeks to see if this is your place to call home. And maybe you've been here for a little while and you're saying, you know what, I do love this church. This place is for me. What do I do next? How can I get more involved? How can I learn more about God? How can I get more in his presence and the things that they're talking about? I want to know more about this. How do I get, uh, how do I sing like Pastor Lindsay? I don't know if we can teach you that, but we have something called Next Steps. We have Next Steps that's starting next Sunday, second service at our 11 o'clock service that we want to you to be included and invited in because a lot of times people can have this mindset of church being a place that only a specific person can be a part of. But here's the thing about church and what we've learned about Christ is that his arms are wide open. We want everyone to be a part. We want everyone to get involved. Even Jesus said that the laborers are few, but here we believe it's the opposite. We want our church to be a force to be reckoned with. To where we're, we're seeing souls saved and lives changed because of your influence, because of your giftings and the things that Christ has done in you and you want to tell other people about it. So that's what Next Steps is about. That's happening next Sunday. And so the also this morning, something that we uh, uh, agree in and something that we do every Sunday and we believe in with all of our heart is prayer. Prayer changes circumstances. It changes the atmosphere. It changes what you're going through to where things can seem bleak or small, but then you begin to pray and faith grows and expands. And so we have a couple of things that we want to pray for this morning. Y'all ready to pray? First thing, there's a uh, precious lady that's been a part of this church for years and years. And she's, she's been someone that has been going through something. She has family in another country. And she's actually been traveling back and forth. She just lost her father. Uh, her mother was in the hospital. She has a sister in the hospital and some of her nieces. And, and things have been going horrible for her. How many of you know, maybe you don't know, but when there's a pattern, you know the enemy is after you. He's trying to do something to keep you back, to keep you discouraged. But today, as a church, we're going to pray. We're going to see God move. We're going to pray for breakthrough that she won't have to deal with this any longer, that the enemy has to pay back everything he's stolen. And then there's another uh, another person we want to pray for. There's a, a precious lady that is a teacher or a counselor at Denellen High School. For those of you that might not know, there was a student that committed suicide just, just a few days ago. And what we want to do is we want to lift her up. We want to pray for her in the school also because her heart was, I'm so saddened because we're not there as a staff to help those that are mourning, to help these kids that have questions. And so right now we're gonna pray. We're gonna pray as a church. We're gonna pray for these two different things going on. And maybe you're going through something. You know, sometimes the best thing to do is to pray for someone else and put your needs aside. Because when we start thinking about other people, our problems get smaller and smaller because you know that God's gonna take care of you because you're praying for someone else. Amen. Let's lift up these two precious people this morning and let's just let's just uh, keep asking, seeking, and knocking. Let's see God move this morning. Heavenly Father, we just lift these two situations up to you right now. And I just thank you, Father, that wherever the enemy has stolen, we just speak and we pray for restoration in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, that right now things would turn and would change. And as a, as a family right now, as, as now church family, we lift these two situations up to you. And we thank you that there's nothing too great for you. I pray, Father, that you would bring peace and comfort right now, Father, where it doesn't make sense. You said that you would give us comfort that surpasses understanding, a peace that surpasses understanding. And we pray that over these situations. And we thank you, God, that you will be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, let's get our praise on. Let's keep praising God because he is worthy. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm going to ask you to multitask. Keep those hands going. Keep those hands going. While you're clapping on the beat, tell the person next to you there is power in the name of Jesus. And don't lose the beat. Don't lose the beat. Don't lose the beat. There it is. There it is. Keep 
keep those hands going. Say this. Say, all of hell shakes at the name of Jesus. All of heaven rejoices at the name of Jesus. Everybody believe there's power in his name today. We're going to show you one. Keep those hands going. Lord, you ready? I'm ready. Good. Let's go back. There is power in the name of Jesus. 
There's power, there's wonder-working power in the blood and in the name of the Lamb. Come on, somebody needs to know that today. We got one service. Come on, y'all, you get the rest of the afternoon. Come on, give him one more shout of praise in the house today. Just shout Jesus. Thank you for access to who you are, Jesus. There is healing when I call. There is joy when I call. There is hope when I call you, Lord. You will come when we call. You will come when we call. Sing it all the earth will 
with worship. Your name is powerful. Come on, we got one service. We get to go a little bit. Come on. Give it to him now, yeah. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Lift your restoration, that place of real relationship. Maybe you came in, somebody invited you to church, you thought it was going to be a religious experience. It's not. It's about a relationship with God through His only begotten Son, Jesus, who loved you enough to give His life for you, to live the perfect life that you couldn't live and give you the opportunity to know Him in a real way. If you're here today or maybe you're connecting with us online, it was so good to hear. Got a text a few moments ago from our dear friend Roxanne in Canada. Happy Canada Day to you, Roxanne. And everybody that's connecting with us today, listen, if you're watching on Facebook Live, go on there right now and just tell us where you're watching from. We want to be part of this. But this is the moment to open your heart. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever has happened to you this week, whether it's been the greatest week of your life or the worst storm you've ever been through, this is the moment where Jesus responds to your call. We had a young man on Wednesday night come toward the end of our Bible study Wednesday night, came the last 10 minutes, but at the end of the service came up and said, I need this. I need God to do something. I want to know if this is real. Got to pray with Terry Wednesday night and just touched my heart so much. That's what it's about. One person. One person. If you're here today and you don't know him in a real way, we're not asking you to do anything today, but just open your heart. He'll never force his way into your life. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He won't go any place he's not invited to go. So if you're crowding him out, don't expect him to wrap you on the head and force himself on you. It's about you opening your heart. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. And whoever opens unto me and invites me in, I'll come in you and fellowship with you and let you get to know me. If you're here today and you don't have that relationship, all over this place, I invite you. Maybe it's one person, maybe it's 10. I'm not calling you to the front of the building. I'm calling you to the altar of your heart right now, wherever you are. Say, Pastor, I need relationship. I need to know the Lord in a real way. And I want you to pray for me. If that's you, would you slip your hand up right where you are, all over the place. Just lift your hand up boldly. Proclaim it right now. Hands are going up over here. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Right over here, sir. It says there's someone else. There's someone else. Sometimes these lights, I can't say, God bless you, sir. God bless you over there on that side. Lord, I ask you in Jesus' name to minister life to everyone whose heart is open. And let this be one of those days where everything that they've thought in their head gets into their heart and you bring change. God bless you, young lady. Lord, let this change begin now. Everybody in the room that has your hand raised or everybody that opened your heart, you know what, everybody in the room, say this out loud with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart in a real way. I need you to be the Lord of my life, of my purpose, of my direction. Change me. Forgive me. I repent of my sin and I give it to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. That's the greatest freedom you can have right there. The beginning of Fourth of July week. Freedom week. Come on and give God praise today. 
Give him praise. Listen, if you raised your hand, we have some people who just want to talk to you after church for two minutes, if you're open to it, okay? And this guy right here, Chris Farley, come up here, Chris. Chris is going to be right up here on this side. If you raise your hand, those three or four of you that raise your hands, please come up and talk to Chris after church. In fact, Chris just won a third place championship baseball ring the other day. You're going to want to come see the ring. He's not going to make you kiss the ring. It's not a bishop's ring. It's just a, it's a baseball ring. Man, he showed me that before service. I said, if that's third place, I don't know what first place looks like. It was a national baseball competition for nine through 13 year olds. He's one of the top coaches in the country. He's right here in Ocala, part of Now Church. And he wants to meet with you after church, okay? God bless you. Thank you, Chris. Turn around and greet some people around you. Tell them how nice they look today and you can take your seats in a moment. All right, all you wild people, glad to see you today. I'm so glad you're here for one service today. You know, we really respect family around here, and that's why this Wednesday night, because it's the actual 4th of July, we will not have a service this Wednesday. We always have Bible studies on Wednesday nights, always very powerful, but that won't be happening this week just because, you know, we love to respect family time. When you have the opportunity to get together with family, we don't ever want to stand in your way for that, but we want to just have a great time, a church day. The Word of God, the Word of the Lord can change your life. And so we begin a brand new theme for this month. It's July. Can you believe it's July 1st already? The year is half over, uh, only uh, less than six months for Christmas shopping. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, today we're going to just get into the Word. We begin a brand new theme called Chip Off the Old Block, Chip Off the Old Block. And I'll explain that as we go. It's kind of self-explanatory. We'll kind of get into it a little bit. <clears throat> but I want to begin with the inerrant, the inspired, the infallible word of the living God that's able to change us and transform us. If you have your copy of God's word, please open it or look on the screen with me at Genesis chapter 11. And then we're going to weave in Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> Genesis 11 says in verse 31, Now Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife. They went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. I want you to see, first of all, that the idea to go to Canaan land, to the promised land, did not begin with Abraham. It began with his, began with his daddy Terah. But something happened along the way. There was a family tragedy. It says they came to Haran and dwelt there so the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Let me kind of explain that. Basically, Terah, Abraham's father, he had the call of God before his son to go to the promised land, but he had other sons, and one of his other sons' name was Haran. And when they got to a city in modern Iraq on the way to Israel, on the way to the promised land, his son Haran died. And they named the place Haran after him, and Terah quit in Haran. Terah quit. Terah backed off. Terah never went all the rest of the distance he was supposed to go to his promised land. Now, that's important because as Genesis 12 comes along, it says, now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land I'll show you and I'll make you a great nation. This is the Abrahamic covenant. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and I'll make your name great and you shall be a blessing and I'll bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families, not just the Hebrew families, not just the Jewish families, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Finally, Galatians 3 says this, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us, past tense, from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. 
For it is written, curses everyone who hangs on a tree or on a cross, so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. Amen. Father, would you open the eyes of our heart, grant us hearts that can perceive, minds that can receive, and it's strength to us, for us to believe. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This is the time of year we celebrate freedom. We celebrate the freedom of being in America. By the way, thank you for those of you who prayed for me while I was in Bulgaria last week. Tremendous meetings in Bulgaria. Great church there in Plovdiv, Bulgaria. It was one of the oldest cities in the world that's still a city. We were in, we were in a city, a modern city, but we could see the ruins all around it dug up uh, beneath where we were. And we were, the whole uh, shopping area now, ironically, is over uh, a chariot course from the Roman Empire days. So we were standing over stuff. We were looking at stuff that was before Christ, B.C., right there. And uh, you know the movie Ben-Hur where you see the chariots running and doing the big turn. We were right there seeing this area and we got to sit in the, in, the, uh, in the area where they would make the big turn. It was really fascinating. You know, when you are in America and you see something old, uh, you see something maybe 100 years old, maybe 200 years old, maybe 300 years old. But this was thousands of years old as a city. It was called Philippopolis back in the Roman Empire. And it was fascinating. We, I just want to thank you for sending us there and had a great time. Took two other pastors from the U.S. with me and we had tremendous meetings. We were ministering to uh, hundreds of people, many of whom were gypsies in Bulgaria. A gypsy population is very big. The born-again population of Bulgaria is less than one-tenth of one percent or excuse me, eight-tenths of one percent. That's the under one percent of the whole nation eight-tenths of one percent of the people of Bulgaria are born again. And so just the, the, the field is ripe unto harvest and something good is happening there and we were glad to be part of it on behalf of Now Church in Ocala. This month, we're gonna be talking about the power of family blessings and how to deal with curses, soul ties, and generational tendencies. This may be new type of terminology for some of you, but this is in the fabric of the 28 years of this church that people understand that they have a right to be free in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're gonna talk about these things. You know, when you go to the doctor's office, one of the main forms you have to fill out is the family history form, trying to see if there are any possible susceptibilities, patterns, or generational health issues that need to be exposed or addressed. And I want you to know that there are not just uh, natural DNA issues, but there are what I call spiritual genetics. Spiritual genetics in your life. In the very same way as there are generational hereditary health issues, there are many emotional, spiritual, mental, sexual, financial, and relational matters that we struggle in that have their roots in family history or DNA. Things you don't even know about, and we're gonna show you from scripture. There are studies today and trends today as we have new DNA science the last 30 years where they're solving many unsolved crimes even recently because of things that they could find DNA on 30 years ago that they didn't have the science to actually develop it or type it or show who it was. Today, those things are happening everywhere and all the time. It's clearing innocent people that have been put in prison for crimes they did not commit. And finally, DNA can get them uh, the, the clearing that they need and hopefully a, a life of restoration. And so in our DNA, we have the power in Jesus' name to find freedom, to find wholeness, to find strength. Can you say amen? Uh, I don't know if you saw this story. I've got a little video clip I wanted you to see of a news story I saw recently. I thought it was interesting 
uh, of how DNA works even in family things in our generation. So go ahead and play that if you will, please. <laughs> Five sisters together for the first time. They've lived in different states and have spent six decades apart. Yes, we all look like my mom for yes, sure. Yes. These women, ages 59 to 66, share the same mom. Oh my gosh, this is just crazy. They visit Nebraska Children's Home Society, where three of them were adopted in the mid-1950s, an era of closed adoptions and a time of confusion. That the reason why us girls were given up is because Bill, Dad, didn't, wasn't sure we were his. But guess what? We are. <laughs> Vicki was the only one old enough to know she had siblings. I started searching in 1980 for everybody. Um, and that was back before we had computers. <laughs> A DNA test matched her to Nina, who grew up with their biological mom. A sheriff or something coming knocking at her door and saying, here's something, hand it to my mom, and my mom busted out in tears is all I can re really remember. DNA also helped them connect with Kayla. For me, it's like I was always raised as an only child, and then to find out I have sisters, and then you know, a couple of brothers has popped up here and there, and it's like I have a family now. Jan was the last to get connected. I sent away my DNA, and then got the answer back in September, and then I started contacting these guys. Well, I never dreamed I had this many guys. <laughs> sisters. Yeah. And it's I been an emotional discovery. Their mom died in 2003, but they continue to learn about her and how much they have in common, like their interest in music and art. Yeah. Here, mom, you need a box of Kleenex. <laughs> now, in their matching purple shirts with pins close to their hearts, they're quickly catching up. So it's, it's been interesting to see how everybody else grew up and where they grew up and, uh, and what our interests are. In Omaha, Shin Dillon, KETV, Newswatch 7. Isn't it interesting that you have things in common with people that you, do, you would never know except through the DNA science. They, they were all gifted in, in arts and music. They all looked very similar, didn't they? But they grew up in three different states and here they come together all these decades later and find out that there were certain traits and things they had in common. In the text, uh, Genesis chapter 11, we see the lineage of Abraham called our father of faith. And the Bible says that not only are we related to Adam and receive sin from Adam and Eve, but we also receive through Abraham spiritual genetics of faith. We now, through Jesus Christ, find that we have a right to live in freedom and in the blessings of Abraham. We know from Scripture that his father Terah was an idol worshiper, an idol maker. Uh, Joshua talks about that in Scripture as well. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. And I found it interesting that even though that was the family business, that God began reaching to that family in mercy, looking for a family of his own on the earth. Even though they had turned their back on God, even though they, were, they made idols, they sold idols, they worshiped idols, yet God saw in them a heart to look for God, look for the real God, look for him in a real and divine way. And so even though that was the family business, God reached out to Terah and he was supposed to go to Canaan land. God promised Terah, I had never really seen that until a couple of years ago. And he, uh, but he never finished the journey. He, he never finished what he was set out to do, what God had put in his heart. Why? Because of tragedy. You know, the Bible says that our God is a healer of broken hearts. Amen. That the Spirit of the Lord is upon, was upon Jesus and is upon us as Jesus' church representatives because God has anointed us to heal brokenhearted people. Tara, his heart was broken because one of his sons died on the journey. And the Bible says, Tara kept living there another hundred years and wouldn't budge even though he was on his way to the land of promise. And so what we find from the scripture is that there are moments that God wants to deliver you. He wants to separate you. He wants to, to, to have a relationship with you for himself. 
but you have to be willing to get up and move forward even in moments where your heart is broken or your life is stuck. You have to be willing to, to find a way to find the gumption to move forward when your heart is broken or you've been through uh, 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 something uh, out of left field that has tried to take you out. You have to be willing to open your heart and let God heal you in those moments. I would say this way. There are moments when you're struggling because of loss or pain or being in a situation you never thought you'd be in when God says, turn the page. Everybody say, turn the page. Turn the, page. the book is being written on your life and sometimes you have to turn the page. You have to turn the calendar. You have to turn the page to the next chapter and let God begin to write on your life and on your heart. Tara stopped at the point of his deepest loss and his deepest pain. And if you're not careful, you'll stop there too. Listen, we'll all go through, we all go through challenges in life. There's not one person here that's exempt. No matter how much faith you have, you're not exempt from loss. You're not exempt from challenge. You're not exempt from difficulties. We all go through them different seasons, different times. One of the reasons why we believe in the power of the local church is because the Bible says when you're together with other people, if you're down, somebody else is gonna be up. And somebody else can lift you up and help you even when you don't feel like you even want to get up. Somebody can help you get up or crawl another step forward at least. Deliverance, that the promise of Jesus is he's our deliverer. Deliverance happens even at the worst moments of our lives. But you can't quit. The Bible says, Terah died in Haran, the name of his son, the city, the place that he knew where his son had passed and he wouldn't move forward. Recovery is about moving forward again. And I want to say this to you. Maybe you're watching. Maybe you're here in the room. Regardless of what you've been through, I promise you this. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus will be delivered, will be saved, will be changed, will find healing again. You might not be able to smile right now. You may be at a place in your life where you feel like you could never smile again. But I want to tell you, in, as an honor to the people who got you to where you were and the people that you lost along the way, as an honor to them or in spite of them, get up and take another step. Get up and believe again. Trust God again. Reach out. Open your heart and let God do something great. It may take time. It will take time. Now, how do we do that? In the passage of Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, God says something interesting to Abraham right after it tells the story of Terah and the fact that he stopped and the fact that he died where he stopped. And it says, and God spoke to Abraham and said, get out of your country from your father's house. I want to say this to you. There are moments as you discover about your, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and let me tell you something, in our family lines, nobody has a perfect one. We all have skeletons in the closet. We all have people in the family that were notorious or scoundrels. We all have some of our, maybe some great people, some history-making people that we're connected to, but we're also connected with people that you don't want anybody else to know about. And that's okay. But regardless of the good, the bad, and the ugly, God said to Abraham, and I'm saying to you, to move forward in this understanding, set some distance. You have to be willing to set some distance. God said to Abraham, Abram at that point, he said, look, get out of your father's country and get out of your father's house. He wasn't saying your father was horrible. He wasn't saying, he wasn't saying we're gonna dishonor him. No, God says, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and you may live long on the earth. But this is not a dishonor thing. This is about there are some times where you have to separate or step forward from your natural heritage and choose to set some distance 
between those things that are nipping at your heels. It's not about disrespect, but listen, as much as God says, honor your father and mother, there are whole people groups all over the world that worship their ancestors. We're not called to worship our ancestors. We're supposed to worship God. Only God. Some people worship ancestors. No, this is not ancestry worship. So God said, look, there are moments where you have to intentionally push away from the things that made the previous generation stop. You have to push away, push on, set some distance so that you're moving forward. Even though Abraham and his wife, the Bible says at that time were having trouble conceiving their own kids, they believed for, the fam for a family line of their own. Abraham, the Bible says, believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He, when he believed God, he obeyed God's direction. And God said, get out, from where, get out from where you've been. Get out from where you're stuck. Get out from where your father was stuck. I was trying to do something for the whole family. Dad chose to stay there. That's fine. But Abram, I want you to move forward. And you may have to leave some of the baggage back there in Haram. You can't carry your father's pain and still find your father's promise. Are you getting this today? This is, we're just setting up the month, but this is the beginning, the foundation for the whole thing. I'm not saying that you ever write off family completely. I'm saying you have to put God first. God first. Honoring your father and mother is a kingdom principle, but that doesn't mean as an adult you obey everything of them. You have to put God first and obey him. Next, family is more than biology. Family is more than biology. The Bible says there is spiritual DNA. You have a tribe, you have a people group, you have a local church, you have a family. Psalm 68 says this way, verse six, God sets the solitary, the alone, in families, he brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Your prosperity, your accomplishing the purpose for which you've been sent to the earth has more to do with your spiritual DNA than it does your natural DNA. Your natural DNA gave you a certain hair color, a certain eye color, uh, whether you have hair at 50 or no hair at 50 or blue hair at 50. Your natural DNA tells the body style, the body type. And we spend our whole lives trying to get on a diet to outlive or outdo what we, you know, what somebody else looked like in the family. We try to do all those things, but understand this, family is more than biology. Family is relationship through the family of God, relationship through the blood of Jesus Christ. You therefore have a new bloodline. You have a new bloodline. Say amen. amen. <clears throat> you don't have to be afraid. Just because there are skeletons in the closet doesn't mean you're going to let history repeat itself. Hey, let, me, let me just deal with this for a second. Um, when we talk about these generational things and even uh, some people, Marilyn Hickey used to use the term generational curses. That, that's, it's an appropriate uh, thought, but I want to say this to you. If you're in Christ, the enemy has no legal right to curse you with anything. Jesus went to the cross. The Bible says Christ has redeemed us because it's written, curses everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus went to a tree and became hell, hung on there as your curse so that you have no legal right to be cursed anymore, but you are blessed with Abraham. You are now blessed through what Jesus did through his sacrifice. But here's the problem. There are still tendencies. I don't believe in generational curses as such in the sense that any area where you're ignorant is the only area where you're vulnerable. When you know who you are in Christ, when you know the greater one is in you, the greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, then none of those things have a right to you, but they will still knock on your door. As our kids were growing up, we were honest with our children. 
as they got to be teenagers, of some of our own vulnerabilities that my wife and I went through as teenagers because we wanted to arm them, not to make them scared, but to say, look, don't be surprised when this thing comes to knock on your door because it will. We're not speaking it on you. We're not trying to make it happen to you, but we're being honest with you because we didn't realize that those things knocked on the doors of our other generations too. And we try to prepare them. The problem is sometimes there's a generation gap and parents don't tell kids, even in Christ, they're, they're so, they, they, they see who we are now in Christ. And so we, we don't want to tell or share some of our own vulnerabilities lest we open that door. But I'm telling you, the, the door's going to be knocked on anyway. You've got to teach your children how to answer the door in faith and not in fear. You've got to teach your children, look, and I'm not saying tell, tell your seven-year-old. I'm saying as they get to be more mature and they, and they start to ask questions and they start to deal with some of their own issues, instead of closing that area off and saying, no, we don't do that and we don't talk about it because we're Christians. We, we, we in effect, close the door on communication. If you, listen, if you have children, there are, there's a good chance your parents had children too. It runs in the family. Just want to see if you're awake. If, the, if you struggled, there's a good chance, because listen, God is the creator, right? We talked about that a couple months ago. God's, the first thing God reveals about himself, in the beginning, God created. First thing God says, yeah, I want you to know about me. God says, I'm, a, I'm your creator, right? The devil hadn't created nothing. Pardon my English. The devil is a liar and a counterfeiter, not a creator. So the enemy counterfeits things that God does in truth. The enemy counterfeits and pollutes and perverts and twists them. And then he does the same thing over and over and over and over. And the enemy, the only thing he has, he doesn't have, he doesn't have authority. Jesus has authority and says, and I give you authority in my name, right? Jesus said, in my name, you'll cast out demons. In my name, you'll speak with new tongues. In my name, you'll lay your hands upon the sick and they shall recover. So we have Jesus' power of attorney. But... Even though the enemy doesn't have authority, what he does have is thousands of years of experience. And in, that, in those thousands of years, he knows the vulnerability of your whole family line. He knows what took down your great-great-grandpa, even if you don't know his name. The enemy knows what line you've come through, what seed you've come through, and what worked. So he'll do the same darn thing over and over again trying to find your vulnerability. Is anybody listening today? Am I just talking to myself? I think this is going to be a powerful month because we're going to see some people get some freedom that you've been struggling in and enforce that freedom in Jesus' name. We all have struggles. In this room, everybody has strengths and weaknesses, and they're all different. But everybody's got weaknesses. Everybody's got a blind spot or two or nine Everybody, no matter how, listen, don't pretend. That's why this is, this is not the church. If you want to come and wear your Sunday mask and put on your, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine, brother. How are you, sister? Good to see you. I'm fine. Everything's great. We're faith people here, but not, we're not fake people. Okay? So, so in this place, we want you to be able to be here and be maskless. Okay? And to get real to the point with, with when you're struggling, we've got other people who want to help you with your struggle because we've all struggled. And if, we didn't, if we're not struggling today, we'll struggle another time because life is messy. Life has challenges. And we've got to make sure that we are girded up and understanding exactly what rights we have in Jesus Christ. You don't have to be afraid of the skeletons in the closet, but you do have to know how to deal with them when those skeletons knock on the closet door. The Bible says be armed with knowledge. Be armed with knowledge. Don't be afraid of curses. Hosea 4, 6 said this, my people are destroyed for what? For a lack of knowledge. 
because you have rejected knowledge. Hereditary things have no legal right or standing in your life. Let me say it this way. The struggles of your parents and grandparents, brothers and sisters, is not inevitable that you'll struggle with it. It's inevitable. It will, it will come knocking, but you can shore up those areas of your life in Jesus' name so you can answer the door with the power of God and sweep those things out of the way before you ever have to struggle with them deeply. If your dad had heart trouble, the doctor's gonna wanna know about it. But you're gonna have to be able to say, but I have a new father too. And my heavenly father has no heart problem. My heavenly father has no health issue. When my dad was about my age, my dad had prostate cancer. And so when I was in my late 30s, I began to take supplements and, and just began to do things to prepare myself. And then I have kept, I have a, a doctor where when I start, when I turned 50 a few years ago, I started going to a doctor where I could get blood tests and check out for DNA, um, th things that you might be susceptible to through your DNA. So I did all those, those kind of tests at 50. And uh, one of the great things that my doctor found is, he said, uh, you have a very rare condition. Uh, um, he said, you are 10 times less likely to ever have prostate cancer than the average man. And I said, praise God, I received that, okay? But he said, we're still gonna watch you in your mid-50s for uh, different hormonal issues and things that your father might have had. He said, I don't know your father, but he said, we're gonna watch for those things. And if those things happen, we're gonna do some things for hormone replacement therapy and things like that, because you will never have prostate cancer like your father did. And I said, yes, I, I am at the right doctor when you speak that way over my life. Because <clears throat> I'm not there looking for trouble, I'm there looking for solutions and answers and believing in faith. But doctors are looking, they're looking, for the, they're looking for the worst stuff most time under every rock, okay? So you have to go in faith, but you have to, part of the thing that I decided to do is handle this issue and not just be uh, like in the back of my mind letting the devil play with me. Okay, late 50s, oh boy, late 50s, oh boy, late 50s, no, no. I have approached this thing with, a, with, I believe, the spirit of faith and a plan and a purpose from God. And sure enough, in my, when I was about 54, my doctor said, yeah, we, I, this is exactly, he said, You're, everything's falling off the cliff here. We're gonna get you on this uh, uh, HRT, hormone replacement therapy. And he said, this is gonna help enhance the fact that your DNA already said you're not gonna have this, but we're gonna help you and prevent this even further. Now, folks, I'm just telling you, I don't know what's right for you, but I'm telling you, for me, I wanna be open and honest about that stuff because any issue that your dad or your mother had, when you start to get to that age, it'll start to mess with your mind. My, my grandfather died when, uh, when he was 77. And I could see as my dad, my dad's 79 now, about to be 80 this year and in great health in Jesus' name. He was totally healed by the way of the prostate cancer uh, all those years ago and I'm so thankful that he was. But I could see as my dad was starting to head toward his... 77th birthday. In fact, from the moment he turned 70, my dad started thinking about it, about that his father died at 77. I could see it. I started challenging my father in faith. I said, okay, that's, this is different. My grandfather had heart attacks. My dad has a great heart. And so, I, I, look, you gotta believe. So I don't know what your particular situation is, but I wanna tell you that through the word of God, you can stand in faith and begin to deal with those things head on and not be afraid and not let the enemy mess with your mind and torment you with the fact you're going down the same pattern. It is written, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue rising against you in judgment, you shall condemn. It doesn't say you shall ignore, it says you shall condemn. There is a certain amount of spiritual warfare that is required to move forward in this life. We are not ignorant of the devil's devices, the Bible says. 
the ultimate aim of Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant, God said, look, you, lead, you, you separate yourself from your father, from your father's house, and start a new bloodline, and I'll bless you. I'll make your name great, and you'll be a blessing. Can I tell you your prophetic future today? You are blessed, and you are so blessed that your destiny is to be a blessing to everybody else around you. That's your destiny. That's God's best for you. Whether you came in struggling this morning or not, that's God's best for you. That's his plan for you. And your best days are ahead of you, not behind you. I don't care how young or how old you are today, don't let the enemy start painting that picture of you dying before you're dead. Tara quit a hundred years before he died because his son died and he couldn't get over it. And it hurt the whole family line. You are blessed to be a blessing. That's your inheritance through Jesus. That's the real meaning of prosperity. God moves through you for others. God moving through you for others. That is your destiny. That is your heritage the Bible says we are heirs with Jesus, joint heirs with Christ of everything that Jesus has come to give to us by faith. I love Psalm 112. I'm almost done. <clears throat> Psalm 112 verse 1 says this. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man or woman who fears or worships the Lord, who greatly delights in his word, his commandments. Look at the promise, verse 2. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Keep it there for a second. Read that again. See that again. Your descendants. Are you a worshiper today? Amen. Do you love to worship Jesus? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you worship him above every other God, above every other situation? Do you worship him above ancestors? Then the promise is this. You're blessed because you're a worshiper. And look what this blessing does. Your descendants, your seed, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren will be mighty on the earth. That's what it says. Everybody say it with me. My descendants will be mighty on the earth, spirit, soul, and body. Do you believe it? Your generation is going to be blessed. And verse 3 even says, and wealth and riches will be in his house. Amen. And his righteousness endures forever. It even affects your finances. Amen. We're going to talk about that later this month because it's so important. Let me give you the definition of blessing before I close. Blessing. My best definition of blessing is this. To be positioned for success, fulfillment, significance, and abundant life. To be positioned for success, fulfillment, significance, and abundant life. Bless, being blessed doesn't guarantee you're never going to have a problem. But being blessed means God has aimed you in the right direction. He has set you toward a direction of abundance, of fulfillment, of a, of a full life, a rich life, a good life, a blessed life. It is God's blessing to your, to your life. Now, what is a curse? It's the opposite. I'm not going to put it on the screen. But the curse is simply that you are, you are, you are being thwarted. You're being, you're being pushed back from success. So it's your position for failure, your position for, uh, to, be, to be listless and, and directionless in your life, your position to be insignificant, and your position to be broken, poor, and downcast your entire life. That's what a curse means. I want to ask you this today. How have you been aimed lately in your life? How has God positioned you experientially? Because spiritually, he has pointed you towards success. Spiritually, he's pointed you towards the fulfillment of your purpose in this life. He, spiritually, he has, poor, he, has, he has aimed you at a direction where you cannot die until you fulfill everything God says for you to do. And I don't know about you, but that makes me feel so blessed, so secure, so strong. 
God promised, God's promise is even to aim your seed in the same direction. That's the legacy you have. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. God says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and to give you a hope. When I think about it that, it kind of blows my mind. God meditates. I don't mean like the, you know, pretzel position humming. I mean like he thinks about. You know, the, the word says God's thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God's ways are not your ways. His, his thoughts are not your thoughts. His ways are higher, right? Not lower. His thoughts are higher. What's God thinking about, about your future? The Bible says he's thinking about your shalom, your peace. The word shalom there, I'll define it for you before we go. He's thinking about, meditating right now. God is thinking about your shalom, your peace, your prosperity, your well-being, your contentment in your life, your health, and your wholeness. What are you thinking about? Because that's what God's thinking about. God's meditating on your future. And he's thinking about all of his goodness that he has reserved for you. But you have to prepare yourself for it. Because generational blessing affects every area of your life, even if you're the first one to surrender. Even if you've never had another Christian in your whole family, even if you're the first one to be born again, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be growing in God and getting closer to him and leaning into him and getting involved in a church family, even if you're the first one, the promise is that God's heart is for you. But most of you probably aren't the first one, are you? Somebody prayed for you. Somebody believed. Somebody in a previous generation set out a few minutes a day to say, you know what? I'm gonna believe God for my seed, my posterity, my legacy. Somebody, how many of you know the person who, or people that prayed for you in previous generations? How many know those names? Wave at me if you know those names. See, some of you don't, maybe about half. Somebody prayed for you, whether they were in your family or not. Somebody loved somebody in your family enough to pray a neighbor, a coworker, somebody along the way that saw the struggle. I want you to know that God loves you and his heart is to see you blessed. His heart is to see all those curses, all those things. And listen, you'll know curses. I think it was Pastor Tristan said earlier about recognizing things by patterns. If you've struggled in a certain area of your life, that's an area where the enemy's curse has been knocking on your door. This is a month of freedom. This is a month to talk about not just the freedom we have to worship God in this great country, and I'm so thankful for it, but this is a month to learn about your rights, your bill of rights in Christ Jesus, and how there are moments you have to step up. Even though Jesus gave you the victory, you have to step up and enforce that victory in his name. This is a month where your life may change, where your life may open up, where you might have the light bulb moment to say, oh, wow, I, under I, I recognize where that came from, or I know, I realize that's been a, a continual source of pain and struggle for me and everybody in my family. And that thing stops in my generation. Amen. That thing stops now. It's not gonna go further than me right now because of Jesus. Amen. And you can help those other generations along the way to prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare a way for him to move in your life. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word today. Holy Spirit, would you come and move in this place? Lord, in you we have freedom. Lord, we take up the applications of your word today and we proclaim that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Lord, for those who've been struggling with the ashes of what somebody else left them in a generation. Maybe you're here today and you didn't have a father or a mother. Maybe you were adopted. Maybe you were raised in foster care. Maybe you had an abusive father. Maybe you had parents that died young and you didn't get to really spend as much time with them as you wanted to. 
Maybe in your family line, it's filled with certain patterns of certain diseases or sicknesses. I want to say this to you. The good news of Jesus Christ is this, that you don't have to just submit yourself to the lot in life that the enemy said you were born into. Because if any man is in Christ Jesus, that person is a new creation altogether, a brand new species, a brand new bloodline, a brand new DNA. What are your patterns? What are the struggles? This month I'm gonna talk about ours a little bit. I'm gonna be open about it because we've struggled in certain areas and patterns as well. The great news is this through Jesus Christ. You can find freedom. You can find that significance. You can find healing. You can find total deliverance. And Lord, we praise you for that today. Thank you for your word. Put your hand on your heart right now. Lord, I pray for every person who's listening to the sound of my voice right now. I pray for wholeness, shalom, the peace that passes understanding, that guards our hearts and minds. Lord, today we just take authority over sickness and disease that's tried to come through the family line and we evict it. Heart trouble, go. Cancer, no. High blood pressure, out of here. Sugar diabetes, you have no power over the people that belong to Jesus. Every curse is cut off and sent back into the darkness. And every blessing of God through Jesus Christ we receive by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Did you receive that today? Did you get something from that? <clears throat> Ushers, while you're prepared, would you stand up? We're going to receive our offering before we go. We're going to go out with a great song in just a moment, but I want you to prepare your best gift right now. Can I say this to you? Uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about this month, one of the biggest things my wife and I dealt with for years, and it came right through our family line from both sides, and that was, was financial struggles. And I've determined to take some time this month, not the whole month, but one of the weeks I'm going to talk about it because I was reading another article again the other day. Do you know the leading cause of divorce in our country is arguments over finances? And yet in the average church, we won't talk about money because people get nervous and don't want to talk about it. I want to tell you, listen, if you're here today visiting with us, we didn't invite you here to take any of your money, okay? So just relax. We're blessed because of what God is doing through people that have a revelation of this. And that's the only people we want to give today, okay? If this is something that's in your heart to do, when we do that and pull the resources, let me tell you what we're doing the, the next couple of weeks. We're so excited. We're remodeling our nursery for our infants and toddlers the next few weeks. Because of your giving, we're able to do that, not ask you for it, but already able to do it because people are giving here. Uh, we're redoing some of the decorations, the paint, uh, all the things back there for children's area, for the young kids, and we're so excited to be able to do that. And I just want to say a big thank you to those of you that do give here. For those of you that don't have a revelation of that, let me tell you, there's nothing like the freedom you find when you, when you discover that God paid the full price for you of sacrifice so you could walk in an abundant and blessed life. Jesus said this. He said, the thief has come to steal from you, come to kill you, and come to destroy you. But Jesus said, but I'm not like that. I've come to give you life and give it to you in super abundance until it overflows. This month, we're going to be talking about overflowing in life overflowing in life. Amen. Amen. Father, bless the people. Bless us as we give today. Bless us as we sow our seed and give our gift. And Lord, we thank you that your word says that even the tithe helps to enforce the breaking of every curse 
So the blessing will begin to flow and you open the windows of heaven and pour out the Spirit of God into every life. In Jesus' name, we celebrate you, Lord, and we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, thank you for giving today. Let's go out with praise as we do. Go on. Ushers, go ahead and receive that. What a powerful word this morning. We're going to go out with a little bit of a celebration today.
love you for coming tonight. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us at Now Church. For the latest updates, visit us at nowchurch.com, including live or on-demand video, event registration, online giving, and much more. And don't forget to follow Now Church on our social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please use the hashtag NowChurch. Thank you, 